Good evening, everybody. It's lovely being back at Augustana. It's a very great pleasure for both uh, Bunny and me to be here with you tonight, and a very great honor. Well, I'll read some poems from Caper, and also a couple of more recent poems. And I'll sprinkle in a few favorite poems by other poets as well. I'd like to begin with a recent poem of my own. This is called Running with the Wind. He dreamed he was running. He ran, still a child, through a field of tall grass. It stretched, endless and wild. From the back of his house all the way to the sky, the autumn air beckoned, stop running and fly. The grass he flew over broke under his feet in a wake like skywriting before it's complete. His face felt for the wind, its gusts rising and falling, at times almost silent, but never not calling. As a racehorse when racing knows nothing but that, he wasn't concerned that the ground wasn't flat, or even aware that the afternoon would soon be evening. The only thing he understood with the sun going down and the wind out in force, was he had to keep on his elliptical course, which he did until something half buried and strong flung him into the night, and he pre fell headlong and woke in a sweat. The dry grass, the quick air were dissolving. He panicked. He managed a prayer that the snow might come late for fresh days in the field that the shape he had started might be whole, revealed. W. H. Auden, one of my poetry heroes, said poetry could be defined as the clear expression of mixed feelings. And I think that both the reading and writing of poetry do tend to force a confrontation with the intractable uncertainties of life. I'd like next to read you a poem by Yeats, in which he handles ambiguity in what I think is a clear and beautiful way. This is An Irish Airman Foresees His Death by W.B. Yeats. Yeats wrote this poem, as he did several others, about Robert Gregory, the only son of his great friend Lady Gregory, a young man who was killed when his plane was shot down by so-called friendly fire during World War I. An Irish Airman Foresees His Death by William Butler Yeats. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before nor law, nor duty, bade me fight, nor public men, nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. This next poem is from K. Bart. I have a few poems that I think of as my backyard poems, and this is one of those. This is called A Day of Earth and Air. <clears throat> Earth is so much a part of me that when I found a newborn bird dead on the sidewalk, death obscured spring's area possibility. It only took that faint reminder, an ounce of skin crouched, featherless, untragic in its naturalness, to turn my heart more flint-like, blinder. There seemed some shelter in that grave, in the small surrender of hard soil, frozen till lately, in my recoil from the depths that warming skies can have. 
Dun oak leaves cartwheeled, came to rest. As the wind's force fell, they'd fall, and then start kicking up their heels again in gusts, like breaking waves. Each crest set currents off, loose leaves at play, two cardinals sparking in the noon glare, snow melt, sun colored, everywhere. Things moved but didn't mark the day. Oblivious to the season's mood, I spent a couple more hours raking while the earth plied its old undertaking and the wind kept blowing where it would. I've always had a sort of armchair interest in archaeology. The evidence that Cro-Magnon people, the people we modern humans are descended from, lived for thousands of years alongside the much older Neanderthals is fascinating to me, as is the poignant fact that eventually the Neanderthals simply disappeared. The discovery of the Lepedo child added a new twist to the way scientists think about that period during which Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal peoples Existed. It was reading about this discovery that led to this next poem. This is the Lepedo child whose remains were discovered in 1998 in the Lepedo Valley in central Portugal. His bones are red. That drew me in among the published facts and educated guesses. Male, four years old at death. The burial some 24,000 years ago and done carefully, tenderly, might be more apt. Head slightly raised, feet crossed, his left foot on his right, a snail shell pendant at his neck, a name tag, toy, or maybe a holy vessel, and for a shroud and animal skin his people, as if to register indelible grief, reddened with ochre pigment that would bleed and bleed all the long while the shroud decayed. The find is interesting to scholars who, because his skeleton is early modern, who with Neanderthal-like legs and jaw, say he's a puzzle piece, that he shows how much different lines combine to make the species, the well-stirred mixture we are now. I see him less as scientific evidence and more as in every child, a hybrid, yes, touched by the double stain of love and sorrow, which travels like a family chin, and in the inexplicable providence of God, spreads from each generation to the next. I used to do um, some volunteer tutoring at a place called St. Leonard's House on the near west side of Chicago. Uh, when I was working in downtown Chicago, in order to get back and forth between my office and St. Leonard's, I'd usually take the bus. And this next poem came out of one of those bus rides. This is Country Song. The transit system's broke. The buses run under Chicago rain like submarines, regardless. This bus east on Madison. A woman in a Packers jacket sings some country song. She's blind, looks 21 almost, unlovely. Short blonde hair uncombed by the downpour. Storms can likewise leave a tree, and if it's young, give pause to passers-by. Dripping, leaves upside down, and patiently still waiting for the sun. It's evening now, the day submerged in its divisions. She sings on, sings what she sees right through the weather. A lover cheats or dies, but the girl's okay in the song, floating over the verge of tears. We veer, slow hard. She stands, can't help but sway, squeezing by others in the aisle and falls, silent, then disembarks the CTA, into the weeping and expectant world.
entire life I worked as a lawyer. Uh, I did that for over 30 years. And this next poem concerns one especially memorable day from my prior life. <clears throat> now, this is called Lawyer Story, The Settlement, 2001. The call was set for two. He'd hung around, although the news from the East Coast got worse and worse as that September day unwound. Settle, he recommended. It's perverse. Going to court, you're right, you'd probably win, but you'd still lose due to the legal fees. His client's qualms that this meant giving in were met with math and practicalities. About 3.30, he put down the phone and left an empty office for his train. The empty city street proved echo-prone. His steps came back, light tapping, like light rain. Just as a mime can make things when he mimes, we fashion anchors in uncertain times. Well, here's another backyard poem. Although side yard would actually be more accurate, several um, winters ago, my wife Bunny and I received a phone call one evening from my sister, who is a person with Down syndrome, and who has been struggling with cancer for some years. She told us haltingly about the difficulty she was having with a chemo drug she was then taking. And I guess I was still thinking about that phone call the next morning when I was outside shoveling snow. This poem is Seeing Things, Last Groundhog Day. Suddenly, every April, like new suns, born small, too small, to shine for eons, two forsythias beside the house ignite, tight yellow swirls flaring up the ones that begin again. Then May comes, and they're through with flowers green and out of mind and sight. More snow sips down, bare twining branches make matched hermit cells this morning. Pray for me, she'd said, aware, afraid, but how agree to the overflowing sky, another opaque gets twilight dawn, a little sister's pain. Back to my shoveling, time I learned to live in the hushed, leafless earth. Lie low, forgive, for love, the winter, waiting fire and spring rain. Well, apropos of backyard homes, I perhaps should say that Bunny and I have moved recently. Just in the last few weeks, we moved out of the house where we lived for many years and into a condo. Uh, not an easy process in some ways. But we're settling in and beginning to enjoy the new place. Uh, it has a different kind of backyard. Richard Wilbur is one of my favorite poets, in part, I'm sure, because he is such a master of technique, but also, I think, because he seems to share my own presupposition that there's something about the world that suggests a lack of finality that suggests there is more to the sum of things, to reality as a whole, than the appearances we take in through our senses. I'd like to read you a poem of his. Um, this is Trolling for Blues by Richard Wilbur. No wonder I like it. Um, it's a fishing poem. The fish, in this case, being Atlantic bluefish. Trolling for Blues by Richard Wilbur. As with the dapper turns, or that sole cloud, which like a slow evolving embryo, moils in the sky, we make of this keen fish whom fight and beauty have endeared to us, a mirror of our kind. Setting aside his unreflectiveness, his flings in air, the aberration of his flocking swerve to spawning grounds a hundred miles at sea, 
How clearly, musing to the engine's throng, do we conceive him as he waits below? Blue in the water's blue, which is the shade of thought, and in that scintillating flux, poised, weightless, all attention, yet on edge to lunge and seize with sure incisiveness. He is a type of coolest intellect. Or is so to the mind's blue eye until he strikes and runs unseen beneath the rim, yanking imagination back and down, past recognition to the unlit deep of the glass sponges of chiasmodon, of the old darkness of Devonian dream, phase of a meditation not our own, that long melee where selves were not, that life, merciless, painless, sleepless, unaware, from which in time, unthinkably, we rose. Stan as a first year student in 1969. At that time, um, orientation for incoming students still involved beanies and a full week, solid week of scheduled events. Most of the events of my college orientation week have by now entirely faded from my memory. One of these events, however, I have not forgotten, and it is the subject of this next poem. The poem quotes rather freely from John Donne's A Valediction Forbidding Warning. The words from Donne appear in italics on the page, but even without the poem in front of you, I hope you'll hear Donne's words as I read them. This poem is called Welcome Talk, Labor Day Weekend, 1969, and the poem has a dedication. It's for Dorothy Parkin. Saturday evening after dark, inside Centennial Hall, a woman speaking, reading John Donne to brand new college freshmen. They are mostly tuned out, homesick, a little scared. It is the delicate rhymes that catch their ears. Away and say, move love, fierce fears. Just sounds flirting with their attention, blending with the dim interior and the cushioned chairs. Soon they, 500 plus, relax enough to glimpse their sheer dumb luck they know can't last. The trepidation of the spheres, though greater. Images of the distant bloody war in which they do not fight, spatter their minds, vivid as life. They know about real life already, what awaits them. Violence, maybe. Impossible goodbyes, for sure. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. Tomorrow, a few of them will look up valediction and try a studious hour learning the poem. Someone will even write out the ninth stanza for sending with a heartfelt letter. But nobody's thinking that far in advance by now. Thy soul, fixed foot, makes no show. Nobody's thinking much at all. Such wilt thou be to me who must obliquely run. The poem's parting sounds keep soaking in, rhyming, rising, and falling cadences, lie facts. Thy firmness makes my circle just, becoming memory like other things that happen and abide, happen and vanish, and still abide as part of who we are. The next poem is called Signs. It is a sonnet, and it is for an unknown child. A cloud can be a face in certain light. Blotches of snow in March, the candle wax, 
left over from a party, dirty white beneath today's strong sun. I miss the facts that night about miscarriages, their causes, frequency, odds irrelevant to me, and took in stride your absence next to losses that might have been some other night could be. This just unveiled mud won't last. On wet, much older knees, I push the season hard, pressing these icy bare spots in our yard with seed, counting the signs, a decent bet, a whiff of newborn warmth, and it's goodbye. Changes become the dying winter sky. many summer vacations at the same resort in northern Wisconsin while our two sons were growing up. And then just a few years ago, Bunny and I went back to the resort along with John and Andy, our younger son, and his wife. And it was on that trip that Bunny and I had a rather sobering conversation with the resort owner regarding his wife's brain cancer. And that conversation was the beginning of this next poem, which is called Look at the Birds of the Air, which is quoted from the Gospel of Matthew. June, a late evening at the lake, our old, not friend exactly, though we've known him close to 20 years, our host, I guess. He and his wife have run this place forever. He stopped by our cottage by himself. She's up and doing now. No, no more chemo. Wasn't going to help, the doctor said. His eyes relaxed. We found the problem. Low pH. Too acid. Her new mantra is, eat alkaline for counterbalance. Out on the lake next day, the birds are solitary. Steadily a loon treads water in the middle, occasionally making dives, but always resuming more or less its post, keeping its green-black face to front and silent as a sentry. There is an eagle circling four tree heights above tall pines. I also like to fish, spread wings so effortless you sense the strength of thermals lifting toward the sun. A heron, too, gray-robed and still, vaguely angelic, standing back in a small bay's declining shadows, knee-deep in lily pads. I see them. They float on water, wind, and weeds, wrapped in their element. They're not grasping at straws. On second thought, whatever else these birds may be, let me see harbingers of love's long-lost composure, of a world where everything is bearable. And another poem about birds, or in this case, one particular bird, uh, this time the setting is closer to home. This is self-help, step one with example. Night and the day uncoils unending. When every avenue of thought loops like spaghetti, try pretending. Say you're a bird who's somehow caught in someone's screened-in porch. You're still a bird, however overwrought. You rest five seconds on a sill, take off again and bounce. Some bird to the floor. It's not for lack of will you can't get out. It's the absurd escaping you that keeps you trapped. The same as ever, only blurred. The door's propped open now. Your rapt attention shunts. An enemy, you think, his broom in hand, unflapped, attacks. You're at his mercy. He swings, misses swings, and up you glide, back to the trees, where you'll be free, 
at home, yourself, but clarify. southern France and elsewhere in Europe, there are mysterious prehistoric paintings on the walls inside caves. You've probably read about them, maybe you've even visited them. The paintings have been much studied, but very little is known about the paintings themselves or the people who created them. I think the mystery of the cave paintings is partly what interested me in them in the first place. In all events, these paintings are the subject of this next poem. This is cave art. This poem should, by the way, be dedicated to Bunny, whose presence and love in my life have, in so many ways, unlocked the world to me. Cave art. How often, only half awake, I've lectured, see beauty less as art and more as love, and thought of caves, Lascaux, for instance, painted in red and yellow ochres, blacks and browns, to make the horses, bison, ibexes and stags, the aurochs, mammoths, and cave lions, long since extinct, which live on the cave walls. Some charging, some in flight or in pursuit, others stampeding, butting heads, or falling as one horse seems to, helpless, upside down. Another chaos. I can recognize that much from photographs. Inside the caves, the painters left in vain what more they saw, stark, dazzling life that tucked them in and in and still survives as art and evidence. Some days before its light, I try imagining the shadows cast by tiny sandstone lamps, feeling my way along the ledge with paints and tools in tow catching the warning sound of two quick footsteps, not far off. You shift a little, lace an arm around my shoulder, reminding me of mourning and a love larger than Earth's confusion, hidden though, <clears throat> leaving to restless creatures room for visions of beauty they'd risk death for in the dark. George Herbert is another of my favorite poets. Herbert is, as others have pointed out, a companionable poet, which to me is not faint praise because it is, I would say, one of poetry's gifts to be a kind of connection, a kind of fellowship between the inmates of a suffering world, and thus a kind of mercy. This is George Herbert's poem called The Answer. The poem is a sonnet and begins by making reference to white hair and other effects of aging. But I like the poem anyway. <laughs> the Answer by George Herbert. My comforts drop and melt away like snow. I shake my head and all the thoughts and ends which my fierce youth did bandy fall and flow like leaves about me or like summer friends, flies of states and sunshine. But to all who think me eager, hot and undertaking, but in my prosecution slack and small, as a young exhalation newly waking, scorns his first bed of dirt and means the sky, but cooling by the way grows percy and slow, and settling to a cloud doth live and die in that dark state of tears, to all that so show me and set me, I have one reply, which they that know the rest know more than I.
over six years ago now, uh, Bunny had some serious surgery, which went very well, as it turned out. This next poem concerns a man who was spending time at the hospital uh, at the same time, at the time of Bunny's surgery, due to an operation his wife was having, and whose experience was not as happy as mine. Uh, this is a man at the hospital during your surgery and after. Part one. My wife? No beard, but otherwise he looked like Lincoln. Tall, stooped shoulders, too long face, waiting like me, though he stayed on his feet. He'd get no farther than the desk than ask his question. The woman looking up would smile. It shouldn't be much longer. She'd keep smiling, inviting him, it's fresh, to have some coffee and sit down. No thanks. One time his age came up, 78, and that this was his wife's third operation in three months. A fighter, he announced. Most times he just walked off I don't know where and wasn't there to see your surgeon show up a little early, also smiling. Part two. He sat, head bowed, a silhouette, old age late in the war. The evening lights outside glistened, distant and cold as winter stars, and the big window by his table shaped and held him still. I moved, tray first, counting on one last stroll around your floor, IV and monitors all gone, your fingers pressed against my arm, and later talking turkey with the nurse about the protocol for leaving. His eyes, as I ducked past, stuck tight to his plate of pot roast, peas, and homestyle mashed potatoes he hadn't touched. Praying for courage, maybe. Afraid to eat, and then have nothing left. Here's a poem about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It is a very brief meditation on his death uh, and his life. The title of this poem is Easter Spoils, 2012. And there is an epigraph from Bonhoeffer's last recorded words. This is the end, for me, the beginning of life. Words to a prison friend, spoken in haste. Gestapo men had come to transfer him. Low Sunday, 67 years ago, today. The next morning he'd be hanged with others, no question who was strong and who was weak. A room of prisoners praying when the door burst open. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He went, but only after saying his goodbyes, Stealing a few more minutes as a man might steal his own possessions from a thief. Words can survive the worst, which is love's trick. Can on occasion be the love they praise. On this distant Easter night, the world still writhes in its uneven pain. Wakeful, I hear Bonhoeffer voicing love's contingency, love's need. The thousand ways love dies and dies, and may live on in something someone says. This next poem originated in the course of a family trip specifically a driving trip that Bunny and I made a few years ago up to Northfield, Minnesota, where our son Carl and his wife Diane were living at the time. It's called Fall at a Park Life Rest Stop, and it's dated 2012. <clears throat> An hour by interstate, west of La Crosse, 
October leaves burn in the trees, burn out and drop, then gutter in their own dry streams, in wind-blown rivulets that make us pause. The early fall recalls the summer's drought. I've come close to forgetting. Now it seems stiffening leaves go past our feet like clues of interest to an archaeologist, or like a hemorrhage a doctor sees diagnostically as something he can use, a road map leading to a ruptured cyst, let's say, itself perhaps spawned by disease, a cancer. So inductive logic goes by reasoned steps toward the incurable, pottery shards to settlements, from there to a lost city, which in turn will pose the further question why it fell at all. War, famine, plague, or climate change. That scare, the last. The sunlit leaves falling too soon, after a too hot summer couldn't rain, given the well-known wounds to earth and sky. That scare is scaring me this afternoon. It's therefore our relief when we again climb in the car, despite the silence. I can't help but be a little curious. Often what one has seen, the other saw, and thoughts, some thoughts, speak up unsaid. I say she's taking stock. There are the two of us. We have two sons. We have two daughters-in-law. We also have a grandchild on the way. And I'll close. I will close with this small, fairly recent poem. This poem is called Everyday Love. The child, the fifth of five, was born on a March Monday afternoon when spring, still tiny, seemed forlorn. Eternity, the time till June. March ran a little cold that year. The mother, Monday evening on, had colder things than spring to fear and much to do she'd never done. Her husband, business travel, Seoul, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. At home, teenagers tuned to rock and roll, slowed sparingly for baby and mom. The child learned forms of genuine love as flowers learn sun, air, rain, and earth. Some coming, going, on the move. One, a sure ground of being from birth. The child learned happiness and grief. The mother died and grief would stay. Don't think Down syndrome's been relief. The sweetest love is every day. Thank you all. in my own experience at least, much more the latter. Um, I don't think I've ever sat down and uh, decided to write a sonnet or a, you know, a poem in a particular form um, as the first decision I make. Um, you know, a poem usually, in my experience again, it, it usually starts with um, a line that comes into my head. And I usually, you know, let that rattle around a little while and see if it comes to anything. And as I think about it and think about the subject matter and what it relates to and so on, you know, a form will suggest itself. Um, and so then I try that and experiment. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. thing to me. Um, uh, in part, I think I was experiencing, you know, a, a lack in my own working life, um, maybe a lack of beauty, 
I want something maybe to experience beauty more regularly, more directly, more intensely. Um, I'm not sure. I know that um, it sort of started at a time that uh, work-wise was difficult for me, and that poetry, um, I mean, my experience of it was just as a gift. Um, it seemed to come sort of out of nowhere. And I'm very grateful for it, but I can't do much in the way of explaining it. Oh, yes, I can. I guess I would say a lot of the normal things, like read lots of poetry. Um, I'd also say um, do something else. Um, you know, work somewhere, almost anything, to um, experience life for a while. Eventually, that will create all kinds of um, ideas for poems. Um, maybe the need to write them. Uh, I mean, one, I think, perennial problem for any kind of writing is um, the time. You know, it takes time. Uh, and yet, the other side of it is, for me anyway, it's, it's very hard to just sit down and just out of nothing write something, write a poem. You know, it has to be something that already I'm thinking about that means something to me that I've experienced. And then that will lead to a poem. So I think to write poems, again, according to my own experience anyway, there's always this kind of struggle of balancing, of having a life outside poetry, um, and yet giving enough time to the poem so that they actually happen. I don't know how to solve that. I don't think I've solved it exactly, but uh, it's hard. It's hard. Oh, yes. I don't know exactly what to say because I don't know what things would have been like if I hadn't, you know, spent so much time being a lawyer. Um, but I know that uh, being a lawyer gave me lots of experience of life. Um, you know. Uh, once, uh, I remember in a summer when there was a, a drought, uh, and we had a, a bush on the side of our house that, you know, after some weeks of no rain, gradually started to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it was clearly dying. And so what I did, you know, before it really started to rain is I cut that bush back so it was small, you know. And then the rain did come, and it grew back, and it survived. And I think, in a certain way, being a lawyer cut me back a little until I really uh, needed the rain, but could um, survive until it came.
You're talking about the man in the hospital poem? Yes. Yeah. Um, it was so inspiring. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I didn't feel inspired. I felt afraid, you know, because um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen with Bunny. And I think what struck me about that man is, you know, that could have been me. Thank you. Thank you.